Hello, my name is John Antonakis. I'm Professor of Organizational Behavior at the Faculty of Business and Economics, Asher Sayer, at the University of Lausanne. And yes, it is I, John Antonakis, with hair. Just a couple of months ago, I used to look like this, just in case you think I'm impersonating him. So, a question that's on the minds of many Americans, many Europeans, and many people all over the world is, who is going to win the US presidential election on November the 6th? Ever wonder why it is people vote for a particular candidate? In this podcast, I will show you an election model that I have developed with Philippe Chacard, currently at Wharton, um, which predicts how the voters are likely to react given certain economic conditions and given a choice between two candidates. In our model, we first take into account economic factors and incumbency factors. So this part of the model is based on Raymond Fair, who's an economist at Yale University. He proposed a model wherein um, economic factors are used to predict how the voters are going to react. It's a very basic model. So what the model does is it looks at the state of the economy, inflation rate, uh, GDP growth rate, um, long term and current, and then um, predicts the extent to which voters are going to reward or are going to punish the incumbent party. So if things are going well, voters are likely to reward the party or the incumbent um, by uh, giving them the, um, a mandate to, to, to serve again as president. If things are going badly, they will punish the incumbent or the party of the incumbent. So that's how uh, the economic factors play into the picture. Incumbency also plays into the picture. A sitting president has an advantage. They are more recognizable, um, they have more airtime, etc., etc. So being an incumbent is, is more likely to, to, to get the, the person re-elected, if and only if they are running for a second term. If the party has been in power already for one or two terms, it becomes less and less likely that the, uh, the, the candidate of that particular party gets voted in because people just get fed up of one party being in power. So this is all very nice. This model does an exceptionally good job in predicting presidential election outcomes. In fact, it predicts 17 out of the last 24 elections correctly. So how does our model add to the picture? Well, what we suggest is that yes, the economic model is nice, but it lacks one important ingredient. And this important ingredient is the alchemic ability that somebody has to rally people behind their vision. What we're talking about, of course, is charisma. Charisma for us means um, having some kind of ideological or some kind of emotional link with your constituency. So it's a symbolic influence that's not based on carrots and sticks, in other words, threatening uh, people or, 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 or giving them rewards, but it's really on, on doing something that's right, something that people can connect with, something that people can identify with. So having charisma gives an individual the ability to really influence others in ways that they can take them on, on a long journey, on a mission to accomplish something. So charisma adds to the model um, in, in a very particular way, what we discovered is that people will look to see who resembles a leader, who is more likely to be prototypical of a leader, who looks more charismatic. And it only matters when people are not sure whether to blame or to reward the incumbent party or the incumbent president. In other words, if the economic situation is, paints a mitigating picture, if, for example, growth is okay-ish, but a bit, of, a bit sluggish, you know, unemployment has come down, but it's still a bit high. In other words, the current situation we have now is, is a good example of a mitigated economic picture. That's when the voters are going to turn to, to see who is more charismatic. Who do I like more? Who is probably going to keep the bow steady in a difficult time? Who can I trust? So what our model suggests is when the economic situation paints a mitigated picture, that's when the charisma difference between the two candidates is going to matter greatly. Charisma is a very slippery beast to measure. 
very often when I ask people to define uh, what is charisma, they, they look at me with a blank face. They know it though when they see it. So we can, we can tell the charismatic uh, leader from uh, one who's not more charismatic. But what we have done is we developed with Philippe Jacquard uh, a, a charismometer. And this work goes back to, to work that I've done with um, Marika Fenley and Sue Lichti. What we did is we studied um, charismatic leaders and non-charismatic leaders to see what distinguishes their, um, their speeches by, by uh, the, the, the tactics that they use, the rhetorical tactics that they use in their speeches. So for example, charismatic leaders have a tendency to, to, um, to talk uh, around stories, to talk about their moral conviction, to set high goals, to communicate uh, confidence that the goals are achievable, to speak in metaphorical terms. So let me just give you an example by what I mean. We're going to see an excerpt from the speech that uh, Obama gave at the Democratic National Convention. Pay particular attention to the metaphors he uses, the contrast he uses, in other words, his position versus another position. Pay attention to the rhetorical questions he asks. Pay attention to the metaphor of, uh, of the economy being sick. And he dots it a bit with, with humor, which is difficult to pull off at times. But this is an example of charismatic tactics. I think in the sequence of sentences we're going to see, there are about five or six sentences, and he uses about eight of these tactics all at once. Now, our friends down in Tampa at the Republican convention were more than happy to talk about everything they think is wrong with America. But they didn't have much to say about how they'd make it right. They want your vote, but they don't want you to know their plan. And that's because all they have to offer is the same prescriptions they've had for the last 30 years. Have a surplus? Try a tax cut. Deficit too high? Try another. Feel a cold coming on? Take two tax cuts, roll back some regulations, and call us in the morning. So we went through the convention speeches, both of Romney and of Obama, sentence by sentence, two independent coders graded each speech, and we came up with a score. And here it is, ladies and gentlemen. As you can see, Obama has the edge, and it's a really big one. The difference is, is really big. I mean, it's almost double uh, the charisma score of Obama as compared to, to Romney. We're talking 49% versus approximately um, 84%. So what does this all mean? When we plug in the numbers into our statistical model, our model predicts that Obama is not just going to get 50%, not just 51, not just 52, at least 53% of the vote. In fact, the estimate that we have is much higher than that, but what we've calculated is how probable it'll be that he will drop below a certain threshold. And what our model says, it's highly unlikely that he's going to get less than approximately 53.5% of the vote. It's likely he's going to get something between 53, maybe all the way up to about 57, 58, 59%. I mean, it looks like it's going to be a landslide based on the figures we currently have. And I'm pretty confident of the prediction we're making because our model accurately predicts 22 out of 24 of the last US elections. Pay attention. Our model predicts the vote share of the Democratic Party and not the number of electoral votes. Now, usually the vote share strongly predicts the electoral votes, but it's possible that someone wins the vote share and loses the electoral college as uh, Gore did against uh, uh, Bush. But given the numbers that we have, it, it's pretty clear that the person who wins the vote share with such a large margin is also going to win the electoral college and will be in the, in the White House. Is it game over for Omni? I don't know. I mean, the numbers that we are showing you now are probable numbers. If nothing changes between now and November, when the election is going to be held, it seems like Obama will probably win. If the economy gets a bit better, then he's going to have a huge advantage. If it gets worse, that's when Romney is going to chip into his lead. So, you know, as long as there's no major gaffe or major scandal on the side of Obama, and, and the economic figures continue the way they are or get more rosy, it just becomes more and more likely that he's going to win. So yeah, it probably is game over for Romney. The writing's on the wall. Obama will probably get re-elected, which is why I've got my money on Obama.